The Amazon Synod is in its final week at the Vatican. Papal Posse member Robert Royal joins us from Rome with an update. And later, former head of the Vatican's doctrinal office, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, joins me for an exclusive to discuss the Synod, division in the church, and his new book, Roman Encounters. Finally, how is the church engaging modernity? JP2 biographer and theologian George Weigel will tell us the world over begins right now. From Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An all-star lineup for you tonight. Robert Arroyo, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, and George Weigel are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on the show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. There's always lots of news and insights there. Lots to cover. First, some news. Abortion and same-sex marriage will soon be legal in Northern Ireland. British Parliament took advantage of the North's divided government by passing an act in July which abolished Northern Ireland's 158-year-old abortion ban and relaxed restrictions on same-sex marriage in Ireland. Since no functioning government was formed by October 21st, Northern Ireland will now be in line with the rest of the UK. We are in the midst of the third and final week of the Amazon Synod in Rome. The controversial proposals to ordain married men and female deacons remain. Meanwhile, new revelations about the Holy See's financial situation emerge, and a furious debate has erupted over those indigenous idols that took a dive into the Tiber River this week. Joining me now from Rome with analysis is Papal Posse member and editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal. Robert, thanks for being with us and staying up. Now, I have to start with Pachamama, or whatever the omnipresent indigenous idol is that has in some ways become the symbol of this entire synod. Uh, the Vatican has been needlessly evasive about its origins and what it represents. Now, some say it's a symbol of life. Some say motherhood. Whatever it is, it is not a Christian statue, as you can see. Well, on Monday, video emerged of two men entering the church of Santa Maria in Traspontina, near the Vatican. They remove the statues and then proceed to toss them into the Tiber. Now, what has been the reaction to this in Rome, Robert, to this story? Well, if you mean inside the Vatican, they continue to try to just stonewall about it, say, oh, you know, it wasn't all that important. It means one thing to another person, to one person, and one thing to another person. Mm -hmm. And this is precisely the problem, of course. And the way I would like to put it is they didn't vet this. They really didn't. You know, there's, there's, there's a problem here. Either these things are trivial, in which case I, I don't know why they're important for the sake of the synod, mm -hmm. or they are, in fact, important spiritual entities of some kind, some undetermined kind, that no one took the trouble to look into to mm -hmm. see if it might create a problem. And so just logically, e either all the talk about honoring these, these native traditions is mm -hmm. just talk because it's not all that serious, or they, these are serious things and no one took the, the trouble to see whether they should be entering into the sacred precincts of the yeah. Vatican or that church in Traspontina. It's, mm -hmm. it's really a, a, a wreck, and also the PR part of it has been badly, Horrible. badly bungled. Yeah, I want to get into some of that. And, you know, I've been hearing in, in some of the Twitter traffic and social media traffic, you're insulting indigenous people by throwing these things away. Well, uh, Robert, the apostles insulted the indigenous people of Greece and Rome when they overthrew temples and got rid of their idols as well. So that argument doesn't quite wash with me. Anyway, the head of Vatican Communications, Paolo Ruffini, called this a stunt, the throwing away of these idols. He says discarding the statues, quote, is a gesture that seems to me to contradict the spirit of dialogue that should always animate everyone. And Andrea Tornielli, who's the editorial director at the Vatican Communication Apparatus, he wrote, an image of motherhood and the sacredness of life, a traditional symbol for indigenous people, represent the bond with our Mother Earth, as described by St. Francis of Assisi in his Canticle of the Creatures, was thrown away with contempt in the name of tradition and doctrine. 
Now, Robert, she was on an altar of a Catholic church uh, next to the, uh, an image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. I mean, there's a photo here. Uh, your thoughts on the Vatican's efforts to defend this image that they have yet to fully explain the origin or significance of? Right. Well, look, I think that this puts this controversy into some secular debate about dissing people of a certain ethnic background or certain racial background. This has nothing to do with that. They, they don't seem to be able to perceive that some people see this as a theological question, that, that we want to know what is our church actually bringing in mm -hmm. from the Amazon here to Rome. Yeah. Now, look, on the face of it, what the purpose of the Vatican is, is to bring Jesus to the, to the Amazon, not to bring Amazon goddess, uh, gods or goddesses or spiritualities mm -hmm. to Rome. I mean, obviously, there has to be an enculturation. Missionaries have always understood this. You have to be able to understand mm -hmm. the cultures you're dealing with, try to find some entry point for, for Catholic concepts. But there is just a kind of a brushing off of the potential theological damage that mm -hmm. this might be doing, as if it's solely a matter of uh, sort of like in American uh, uh, ethnic politics or identity politics, everybody has a right to be present. That's mm -hmm. not what's happening here. S certain people see it in theological terms. If it's not yeah. theological, then explain that to us. But you, right. you just can't keep brushing this off as if it's something that it's not. Yeah, I, I kind of see this symbolic of the entire synod. You know, you had this very odd icon, which apparently was created by an artist down in the Amazonian region and then replicated and brought to Rome. So it was an odd thing that uh, in its, on its face was meant to convey something to other folks and w with no real regard for Catholic tradition. So it was an importation of something. And then you have a group of lay people. Now, look, uh, I'm not saying everybody should go overturn what they perceive as idols or, or you know, engage in, in uh, you know, kidnapping things and, and destroying them. However, it is an example of the laity taking matters into their own hands because no one in the upper echelons will respond to their needs, their wants, the actual people in the pews. That's what I somehow see symbolically conveyed by this whole fracas. So we'll see how it shapes out. Apparently, the Vatican is pursuing charges against these two men uh, and, and want to charge them with criminal acts. Now, turning to a more serious subject of the Senate, uh, the ordination of elderly married men to the priesthood and a female diaconate are both in the draft version of the final document of the Senate. Was this a predetermined outcome, Robert? Yeah, I don't know if we know that for absolute certain yet. Um, the, the final document has not come out. And in fact, as always happens at these synods, the last few days, as you know quite well, Raymond, there's a lot of running around and trying to get suggestions in and rewriting. And they already warned us that the final version will not be out until late on Saturday, which is really the final working day of, of the synod. Mm -hmm. But look, uh, I spoke with someone very sympathetic to the pope today, and he said, well, you know, previous bishops have asked John Paul II and, and Benedict uh, for a married priesthood to help deal with their priest shortage. So just, this is just a continuation of that. The difference, though, I think here is that this is the bishops of a whole region, mm -hmm. which really, ha of course, is going to have a, a much greater heft in terms of the impact it might have not only in the Amazon region, but about other parts of, of the world. So I think we're going to see that suggestion being made by mm -hmm. a, ma a majority. Mm -hmm. the, on the question of women deacons, there seems to be some weaseling around, or if you want to put it in more neutral terms, some sort of... Um, sort of massaging of the language. They're talking now about a service of di diaconia, mm. which wouldn't be quite the same as the, the formalness of a deaconess. Well, diaconia means service. It's a, diaconia is the Greek word from which we get the, the word deacon. Mm -hmm. And so it's a service of service that they're now proposing with this, this kind of uh, compromise language, I mm. suppose. I think both of those things will be in there. Uh, we anticipated that from the very beginning. So, so um, sort in many of a, ways, th this there could, actually is a lack of curious. This could end up being sort of a, a, a uh, altar girls of deacons. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I, I think something like that. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, there doesn't even seem to be a lot of interest in what's being produced in the document. In, in the past, people would look at who's voting for what, mm -hmm. what do the small circles, uh, are, what are the small circles suggesting. Someone finally asked at a press briefing today, well, how are the bishops going to vote about this? Are they just going to vote about the general 
document? Or are they going to vote about individual paragraphs? Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like they're going to do, as in the past, individual paragraphs, and they have to pass by two-thirds. But actually, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of drama expected. I think everyone kind of knows that there's a, yeah. it's a foregone conclusion, and we pretty much know what the shape of this is going to be. Well, well, there's no drama because all of the participants have been hand-selected who already had a certain cast of mind and a vision. So it isn't as if this is a constitutional convention where you have fractious, uh, you know, regions coming together to hammer it up. No, no, these people are all in agreement. Those who are in disagreement are not invited, like my guest forthcoming here on the show. I mean, you know, those people just aren't invited to the, to the party. So one of the main architects, Bob, of this synod, Erwin Krautler, who we've heard a lot about, he's the Bishop Emeritus uh, in Brazil, uh, he revealed in a new book, Renewal Now, Impulses from the Amazon for the Reform of the Church, that in his diocese, women are not only presiding over liturgies of the word, they're giving homilies, a practice contrary to Catholic liturgical rules. When claiming that women have too little to say in the Catholic Church, he says, often I refer to the fact that at our end, at the Zingu, things go very differently with where women lead the liturgies of the word, and that they, in doing so, also give a homily. But this experience in Brazil, and perhaps also somewhere else, at the most, a tender flash of light, but it is far from being a proof for the sunrise that we've been awaiting for so long. Does this reflect the general view among synod participants? This is pretty radical stuff. Yes, it's quite radical, and like many other things that, that kind of surround this uh, synod, and again, not not leaving out those figurines which have have theological import. Um, I don't. It's it's hard to say because the 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 news flow I think is this. The, there's just a trickle. It, it's the least I've ever seen in in any. Uh, seen it. We don't even know, even some of these participants, like Bishop Kraut, would say they don't know who, who's written the final document. Mm -hmm. we, we get bits and pieces of hints here and there that, you know, somehow this, the, the, the draft has been produced, and, yeah, there is some work being done with, with other suggestions, but it's quite mysterious. So, it, you know, in, in a way, what they did in the Amazon on their own by allowing women to do these right. things that you rightly point out are not are not in, in, in harmony with what the church teaches, there are larger theological implications that we'll have to wait for the final document to see if they're included. Mm. In his book, Crothler also recalls a very important April 4th, 2014 meeting with Pope Francis. And when he, Crowther, raised the lack of priests in the Amazon, which itself may be a bit of a red herring, Bob. We'll get to that in a moment. But he claims the Pope brought up the ideas of a bishop, Fritz Lobinger. Now, in his 1998 book, like his brothers and sisters ordaining community leaders, Lobinger envisions a team of elders who lead a parish and are ordained and thus able to celebrate Mass. And these elders could be married, male or female, according to Lobinger's idea. How significant is it that Pope Francis brought this idea to the fore? Well, look, there's also been a great effort at, at the press briefings to, to kind of rein in any speculation about what the Holy Father has been saying in the Synod Hall. So we have very little idea of what he's been thinking. But one of the things that they've been talking about over and over again, I've never seen this at a previous Synod, is they, they, they kind of casually just say, well, look, the, the purpose of a Synod is not to produce a document. The purpose of a synod is to walk together and talk together, have a chance to exchange views, et cetera. But ultimately, the Holy Father is going to do whatever he wants, mm -hmm. and that's, that's in accord with various documents that, about how synods are organized. I mean, I think these things are quite radical. I think that the, the implications are going to have to be thought through very carefully. Um, I just learned today from a very reliable source that Cardinal Stella, who in the past had been thought to be one of the leaders of the movement to ordain married men came out very, very strongly in the Synod Hall in favor of celibacy, which mm. I'm told surprised the Pope, as he was surprised when Cardinal Turkson from Africa a few weeks ago right. also came out and made that statement. So insofar as we can see what shadows are moving in the background, um, there seems to be more resistance than you would have thought at the beginning, mm -hmm. but we can't know until we no, see the, finally the Pope what the is document make the is. Decision. If, if, if some of that appears. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and yeah. then ultimately, 
you know, months down the line, he will issue some marching orders. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob, very quickly, because I've got lots to cover and we're running out of time. Uh, this story that we've been fed from the beginning of this synod, really from, from years gone by, that there's a depletion or a lack of priests in the Amazonian region. It turns out 80 percent of the population, according to multiple reports I've read, 80 percent of the population in the Amazon live in populated or metropolitan areas. They suffer from the same lack of priests that, that we do in other regions of the world. Why is this so special? Why is this region, why is it such a crisis that we have to change church teaching on ordination to accommodate it? Well, for me, there's a basic incoherence here. Uh, a lot of the, the talk has been about, you know, environmental questions, uh, people living certain cultures and spiritualities in the jungles and, and whatnot. And, of course, that presents a certain set of problems that doesn't exist everywhere in the world. But you're right. To focus on those particular problems of what is a relative minority of that particular re region itself and to not to look to other solutions. One of the things someone mentioned the other day, which was quite striking, is that there are 1,200 priests from Colombia who are actually assigned elsewhere. They're in the United States mm. or they're here in the Vatican itself. And that the distribution of priests from those Latin American countries themselves has to be restudied. So mm. there are lots of other bits and pieces of, of this story. And look, we, as we've mm -hmm. talked about very often on this show, we know that the numbers of Catholics in the Amazon region is declining rapidly right. because of the evangelizing by the Pentecostals. Yeah. So, yes, there may be fewer priests than are needed, but there also seem to be fewer Catholics, and, and that in itself is a problem. So something much more um, energetic and, and much better focused has to come forward. I don't know whether Viri Prabhati is the right solution, but it seems to be something that has persisted since long before mm -hmm. we got here a few weeks ago. Yeah. That, that certain people, at least, have fixed on whatever the reality on the ground. Yeah. Bob, I've got to go. I was going to talk about this pact, uh, uh, catacomb pact. We'll get to that next week with, uh, with you and Father Murray. I want to talk yeah. about the revelations about the Vatican Bank, Vatican finances we're learning this week, and they are, they are spilling out fast and furiously. New documents, financial documents released, reveal a large deficit at the Vatican and a mismanagement of church funds. The confidential report shows that the Secretary of State used about $725 million on what is described as reckless speculative investments, according to L'Espresso. Now, most of the money came from Peter's Pence, the Pope's charity fund. The Vatican can't be happy with this news breaking during the Synod, is it, Bob? Well, they haven't spoken very much about this. I, I did an article the other day in which I pointed out that Cardinal Maradiaga, who's one of the mm -hmm. uh, Pope's special advisors, and he's very close with the Pope, uh, denied in an interview with La Repubblica, that newspaper of uh, Eugenio Scalfari that we talk a, lo <laughs> a lot about and that seems yeah. to create a lot of problems for the Pope. Right. Um, Maradiaga was already denying that the Vatican was going to go bankrupt. And, of course, when mm -hmm. somebody has to come out and actually deny something like that, it makes you think uh, again about what the possibilities are. But the, the information that's come out most recently, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about this in the, in the mm -hmm. coming weeks and months, is that there are, are declining revenues. Peter Pence, it looks like from this, uh, there's a new book by this, uh, uh, this Italian journalist, Alessandro Nuzzi. Right. He claims that Peter Pence has gone from about 100,000, um, 100 million euros down to about uh, 70 and maybe even as low as 60. So that's almost down to half of what, of what it was almost a few years ago. Mm -hmm. About these investments, I think that the Vatican, um, that the story there is that not so much that they made investments, because it's a good thing to invest money in productive enterprises mm -hmm. or or profitable enterprises, but they bungled the way that, that they, they did this. The, 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 uh, the good economic analysts just say that the way they did this was just reflective of incompetence, and per perhaps there's also some corruption in there, but the, the, right. the major story seems to be they just didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Bob, we're going to leave it there. We're out of time, but we are certainly far right. away from the days of Cardinal Shoko or Cardinal Pell, who had, uh, you know, tried to put the Vatican in the black. Anyway, we will follow up on all of this next week. Thank you, Bob. Follow Robert Royal's reports from the Amazon Synod in Rome at thecatholicthing.org. And be sure to join us next week. The full papal posse will reconvene and recap 
the Amazon Synod, and much more. Now, since the election of Pope Francis in 2013, parts of the traditional practice of the church, if not her teaching, seem to be up for discussion, from the traditional understanding of marriage to who should be received into holy orders. Is the church's role as defender and protector of the deposit of faith shifting? For answers, I'm delighted to be joined here in Washington by the former head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and author of the new book, Roman Encounters, The Unity of the Faith and the Holy See's Responsibility for the Universal Church. Please welcome Cardinal Gerhard Mueller back to the program, Your Eminence. Great to see you again. Thank you for coming in. Now, Your Eminence, I began and we've been reporting on this Amazon Synod for weeks now. Now, before this Synod began, you said Jesus had been driven out of the Synod and that the error was in the working document. This is what you said, a document that does not talk about revelation, about the incarnate word, about redemption, about the cross, about resurrection, about eternal life, but instead raised up in place of divine revelation to be accepted as such the religious traditions of indigenous people and their visions of the cosmos. Have you changed your mind since watching this synod unfold? No, it's not possible to change the mind. But this is also clear that we, before and during and after the synod, we must speak about Jesus Christ. No? Mm -hmm. um, St. Peter, Simon Peter, was instituted from Jesus Christ himself, mm -hmm. and all six, his successors have to um, proclaim mm -hmm. the gospel. You are Christ, the Son of the living God, and this truth contains mm -hmm. all the other truth of our uh, Christian creed. And do you feel that the vis that vision, the church's mm -hmm. understanding of redemption, has that been hijacked with this synod in the name of these indigenous practices and cultures and ecology? Yes, there was a certain veneration or adoration of uh, idols, uh, wooden idols, uh, and this absolutely uh, against the first commandment, mm -hmm. uh, only to adore God only mm -hmm. himself and Jesus Christ is the only savior, is present in the sacraments and not in idols or we have the, the images of the saints, but we don't uh, adore. Right, we don't no, adore. Not adoration, is mm -hmm. on the veneration of this uh, people full of grace, of the grace of God. We praise the, the grace of the God in these persons mm -hmm. and the images of the saints are only uh, representative of mm -hmm. these uh, persons, but as, as such as, as are not uh, venerated and mm -hmm. in no way is uh, possible adoration uh, to human beings, to creation. Right. Because St. Paul um, distinguished no? mm -hmm. what is paganism yeah. Um, the confusion about uh, the, the creator mm -hmm. is only to be adored and the creation is made by the hand mm -hmm. of God. It's, it serves only for us, but it's no point of uh, adoration. Your Eminence, there are reports that this final document from the Synod is going to include a recommendation to the Holy Father that older married men be ordained to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And there may even be, may, a suggestion that females should be moved into the holy orders of the diaconate. Your reaction to that report? Yeah, according to the Catholic doctrine, it's not possible because we believe in one sacrament of order in the three degrees, bishop, priest, and deacon. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we take serious uh, the, the doctrine of the church in the tradition of the church and the magisterium, it's not possible. Um, to um, ordain women in the sacrament of order in all the three uh, decrees. Mm -hmm. And about this uh, married uh, priest, this is only spoken about the very probati, but also the um, priests in the celibacy are, are worthy persons. You must have a vocation mm -hmm. by Jesus Christ. It's not only a, a management mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, um, of social um, order or, or, or needs. existing or needs, mm -hmm. but um, Jesus Christ himself uh, made the vocation to the 12 apostles and this is a model uh, mm -hmm. for us. And he, he said, um, uh, ask the Lord to pray for good uh, shepherds. Mm. In your book, Roman Encounters, you say the idea of female ordination is really prohibited. John Paul II mm -hmm. in 1994 already mm -hmm. taught that this is not possible. 
in the church. Mm. Yet Bishop Erwin Crothler, who's become a very Correct. outsized mm. figure over the last few weeks, mm -hmm. he says John Paul's teaching is not dogmatic. You would say what? Surely it's dogmatic. I think uh, some people don't understand what is a, a dogma. Mm -hmm. A dogma is not only a formal uh, declaration of the magisterium, but is also uh, the doctrine of the church according um, to mm -hmm. the truth of the revelation. And so much mysteries of our Christian faith are not dogmatized in a formal mm -hmm. uh, sense. No? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> was um, the congregation of the doctrine of the faith in the times of Cardinal Ratzinger is that this document of the Pope is an infallible mm. uh, document. No? Uh -huh. So that is it's, it's, it's not depends of a, a meaning of a certain bishop or theologian to to decide what is mm -hmm. the the importance of a document of the magisterium, but the magisterium itself decided mm -hmm. with the um, allowance of, the, of Pope uh, John Paul II and, and confirmation of the Paul, uh, John Paul II that this document of himself is mm -hmm. an infallible declaration. In an interview, you said, mm -hmm. if you watch this Amazon Synod, and here's the quote, you said, if, if one listens to the voices of some of the protagonists of this assembly, mm -hmm. one understands easily that the agenda is entirely European. How so? Mm -hmm. oh, the agenda is about uh, with the probati, uh, the priests, or the ordinary women has nothing to do with the needs and the situation of the Christian, of the Catholics in the, in the Amazon uh, region. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and you mm. feel the main players here and promoters are yes, coming from your uh, native uh, Germany? Yes, native or Austria. Uh -huh. But in the center yes. of, of Europe, no? and, uh, and the, all the money for the synod is coming from mm -hmm. Germany, and the main protag protagonists are not people mm -hmm. of this region, but of uh, European uh, origin. And one of these bishops said, I never, in the, during 40 years, never baptized um, right. one of these uh, Any people. indigenous person. As that is a, a direct offense against Jesus Christ in the baptism has nothing to do with, with colonialism, mm -hmm. but with, with the mission. Jesus Christ is baptizing, is giving the grace mm -hmm. of uh, childhood, of, of God, that we become children of God mm -hmm. in the sacrament of uh, baptism. And if a bishop, uh, a successor of the apostle, is saying we don't need the baptism, is absolutely a contradiction to mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ sent the apostle and all the successors mm -hmm. to all the world to baptize all people, all the believers in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And this is an, uh, an, an example for the anti-inculturation, but everybody has mm -hmm. the right to listen to the word of God and to become um, um, healed and uh, get the salvation in the faith and in the sacraments. Mm. Your Eminence, in your book, uh, you wrestle with this, and it, it, it is purportedly what the Synod is about, evangelization of peoples of the various regions of the world. And in your book, Roman Encounters, you write, the fact of God's work of redemption will not fail, does not depend on worldly factors and power constellations, but rather on his promise that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Christ's promise refers to the stability of his commission, even with a sinful priest, it is still Christ who baptizes. Yeah. And with a bad pope, it is Christ who teaches infallibility through him when it comes to the definitive interpretation of the revelation that God has entrusted to his church. Uh, when you look at the church today, what would you recommend to your brother bishops and cardinals? What are they not doing now? Christ, the church is Christ-centered. Christ is the head of his body, and the body is the church. Mm -hmm. And not on the contrary. Um, a bishop has to speak about Jesus Christ, proclaim the gospel to everybody, and not to present his own opinions. I am not interested in the opinion of uh, mm. a person in, in, in every country, country, 
Uh, I don't think that um, our episcopacy is uh, super intelligent and that all the world depends of the personal intelligence of some uh, bishops in the world. Mm -hmm. What they have to do is to present the gospel. This is the word of God. Mm -hmm. The word of God is responsible. It gives us the salvation and the com complete communion with uh, Jesus Christ. And the church must return to a Christ-centered uh, community. Mm -hmm. And all the Eucharists, Christ himself is present in the Amazon and in the Tiber mm -hmm. and in all the regions of the world in Siberia. Mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't exist the peripheries and the center. Rome is not the center of the Catholic Church. The mm -hmm. center of the Catholic Church is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In Rome is very important, the Church of Rome and the Pope as a principle or the visible unity of the church, but in the face, in the, in the face, in the revealed face and in the sacraments, mm. and it's the one pastoral to lead the people to the eternal life. Mm -hmm. That is the importance of Rome. What in this <coughs> moment of confusion, and you have written about this, you've spoken about this mm -hmm. for years, about the confusion coming out of Rome, the confused doctrine in certain dioceses in the world. What is the role of the laity? I mean, as I told Robert Royal earlier, when I saw those lay people taking those idols out of the church and throwing them into the Tiber, while, you know, I'm not going to weigh in on whether it was a criminal act or not, it shows the laity engaged enough to do something, even something radical, in the face of what they see as confusion and maybe paganism. What is that's the role a, That's a laity? great mistake was to bring the idols into the church, not to put them out, no? because uh, according to the law of God himself, his com first commandment, um, idolism is a grave sin, mm -hmm. and not to mix them with the Christian liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, and this can, to put it out, throw it out, can be against human law, but to bring the idols into the church was a grave sin, was a crime against the divine law. So the, uh, deep difference, no? mm -hmm. and therefore it's uh, worse to bring those that have been uh, to brought the, into the church, not so that to take those them, those out. Took them out. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what should be the posture of the lady? Should they get more engaged? Should they let their yeah, pastors yeah. know, we're confused, we need answers mm -hmm. here, or this yeah, isn't we, right? We, we have, especially in, in the United States, uh, a very strong uh, Catholic laity, a good number of Catholic intellectuals in, among the priests, but also among the laity, and they must engage themselves and, and the not uh, to uh, be the anxious uh, and uh, to be become loud, to have no um, anxiety um, mm -hmm. of Rome or of, of other uh, political reasons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, John Henry Newman canonized uh, uh, some days ago. He wrote a big paper about the importance of the laity mm -hmm. in the church, and he gave the big example after the Council of, of Nicaea, no? yes, Nicaea. Uh, there was the laity who continued with the true faith against mm -hmm. Uh, uh, plenty of bishops who were suppressed by the, the emperors mm -hmm. and the political reasons. Mm -hmm. Say, where they little bit was <laughs> yeah. being, no? and it was a lady and, and who stabilized. Was a lady, no? because yeah. everybody has in the Holy Spirit has a responsibility for the truth. Mm -hmm. no? I've got to get to two quick questions before I let you go. <clears throat> One, during a flight back from Mozambique. The Holy Father was asked about you. I'm going to read this. Uh, he was asked by a German news site what he thought of your recurrent interventions about concerns of the directions of the church. And he said, quote, he has good intentions. He's a good man, but he's like a child. What did you make of those comments? Well, it's good to be a ch child of God <laughs> because if you are not, if you not become children of God, we cannot enter the, the heaven, the kingdom come of to heaven. the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. huh? But on the other side, uh, Jesus said, um, don't say to nobody you are good, because good is only God, no? and all goodness is coming uh -huh. from God, and we are thanksgiving mm. for the goods we have received uh, by God, but we are not instead of God. No? Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we'll uh, leave it uh, there. Uh, I think you're a good man, too, by the way, and I wouldn't call you a child. If, if you're a child, I'm mm. still in diapers. Um, anyway, mm. the man, I want to talk about your film uh, mm. th called The Manifesto mm. of Faith. It released online October 1st. What prompted you to be a part of this? I know they took your writings. You had written this Manifesto of Faith, which you released earlier mm. this year. Uh, what do you make of this film version of your words, your ideas, and, and really your reaffirmation of the faith? Well, it was a good idea to make into the film. No? We are living in this time of mm -hmm. uh, visuality, mm -hmm. um, and not only of, of the word. I come from the old school. Yes. I'm an old <laughs> professor, <laughs> right. professor of writing books and so. Yeah. But we are living in this uh, modern world, and it's good to live in the modern world. It's another form mm -hmm. uh, of communication, but more possibilities mm. uh, of communication, another form. But the, the young people are um, attached of these uh, forms. No? Yes, well, it's it a was new a very, very, very good resonance, very good echo. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody heard it. No? And then mm -hmm. when I was now on the street yes. <laughs> in, in New York on, and in, in uh, Washington and other places in the United States, people recognize me directly. The, the, through from, that from, from wow. the film and other things, all the, all the mm. e, e, EWTN interviews well. and books. No? Yes. Is a, and now and, Roman and Encounters. A, and this, this morning, a young man uh, asked me uh, what is the Holy Father said with Calvary, um, oh. Jesus <laughs> is uh, not of a divine nature. Mm -hmm. and, and he asked me all these uh, questions, uh, oh. and I gave him. The right answers. Ah, well, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Your <laughs> Thank Eminence. You Thank you for being here. The book Roman Encounters mm -hmm. The Unity of the Faith and the Holy See's Responsibility mm -hmm. for the Universal Church by Cardinal Gerhard Mueller is available at EWTN's religious catalog and online everywhere. What really happened when the Catholic Church engaged modernity in the 19th century? My next guest has explored exactly what happened and how it could affect the future. Here's my exclusive interview with theologian, columnist, and author of the new book. The irony of modern Catholic history, how the church rediscovered itself and challenged the modern world to reform. George Weigel. Now, the prologue of this book, The Irony of Modern Catholic History, you write that the conventional telling of the story of Catholicism and modernity is wrong. Well, how is it wrong? It's wrong, Raymond, because it sets up an action reaction cycle in which. It's simply the modern world that acts and the Catholic Church that reacts. And that's just not the way things have been for the past 250 years. A relationship that began with mutual anathemas being hurled in both directions has providentially ended up with the Catholic Church rediscovering the essential truth about itself as an evangelical missionary enterprise. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, the church developed a social doctrine that just might help save this increasingly incoherent postmodern world mm. from imploding. Yeah, I, I want to get into all of that. The, yeah, there's one key figure that this story really revolves around, and that's Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Now he was elected pope in 1878. You point out that he is the pope that no longer said no to modernity, but instead engaged the modern world with the distinctively Catholic intellectual tools uh, in order to convert the modern world. How did that decision to engage change the church? That decision, Raymond, was formed over the 20-some years before Cardinal Pecci, as he was, uh, was elected Leo XIII in 1878. He had been the Bishop of Perugia. Uh, for a long time and during what amounted to a kind of ecclesiastical exile, he really thought through the problem of how the church could engage modernity in order to convert it. So when he becomes pope in 1878, he's got a grand strategy in mind. Mm -hmm. And that is, as you said, to engage the modern world with distinctively Catholic tools, among them the philosophy and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, read in the original texts, not filtered through hundreds of years of commentators, which Leo thought was particularly apt uh, for helping the church deal with all of the new questions mm -hmm. being raised by modern science, modern philosophy, modern ways of reading ancient texts. He was a truly transformative figure. 
And here in Rome, you can see that embodied in his tomb, where he's standing up. Mm. Uh, he's portrayed as standing up uh, on top of uh, the stone uh, casket with his right hand raised and his right foot thrust forward mm. as if to say to the modern world, look, we have something to talk about. Mm. We have a proposal to make. Mm. And that set in motion 80 years of conversation, sometimes argument, sometimes yeah. bitter argument. Mm in the church about how to engage modernity in order to convert it. Now, George, most people would look at Vatican II as the event that really forced the church to engage the modern world. What role does Vatican II play in your telling of this story? And what is the legacy of Vatican II in your estimation? Vatican II is a hinge moment in this story, but the story really begins, as, mm -hmm. as we just indicated, in the late 19th century. Vatican II was John XXIII's effort to take all of that energy that had been let loose in the church by what I call the Leonine Revolution, mm -hmm. focus it through the prism of an ecumenical council, and then get about the business of converting modernity. If, if you mm -hmm. read John XXIII's opening address to Vatican II, it's all about making the truth of Christ available and compelling in, in the late 20th century world. It's about conversion. Now, we all know what happened after the council, 20 years of chaos and confusion. Right. Then come the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. The church is given an authoritative interpretation of the council and comes out of that period with a new understanding of itself, a new grasp of itself, I think would be a better way to put mm -hmm. it as a missionary enterprise devoted to evangelization in, in the now postmodern world. George, wouldn't you say, though, that the church has been hurt by embracing modernity? It really hasn't converted it. I mean, none of the concessions made since Vatican II have really helped grow the church. The new evangelization of John Paul II and Benedict that you, you point out and you highlight in the book, uh, th that really hasn't increased the number of Catholics or the number of vocations. Uh, in fact, the, the ordinations have dropped between 65 and 2002. So w w what's the lesson here? What's missing? What, what was missing was a common thread to tie together those 16 Vatican II documents in, into a coherent tapestry. And that thread was forged by the extraordinary synod that John Paul II summoned in 1985, 20 years after the council, to look at what had gone right and what had gone wrong uh, in, that, in those two decades. And the common thread is this notion of the church as a communion of disciples in mission. Mm. The parts of the world church that have embraced that self-understanding are, in fact, growing today. There were no focus missionaries 30 years ago. There were no growing religious orders of women 30 years ago. There were no great Catholic campus ministries of the kind we find at, for example, Texas A&M University 30-some mm -hmm. uh, years ago. All of these living parts of the world church, which include parishes, dioceses, uh, seminaries like Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, Maryland, which has been full for the last several years. Mm -hmm. These all are the places that have embraced this vision of a church permanently in mission in mm -hmm. which everyone is a missionary disciple. Mm -hmm. The places in the world church that are dying, Germany being example number one, mm -hmm. are the places that keep trying to make the Catholic light project work. It doesn't. Catholic light is boring, uninteresting, and evangelically infertile. Mm. I want to read something you write in the book. Uh, you, you say, rather than killing Catholicism, the encounter with modernity has helped the church rediscover some basic truths about itself. Even more ironically, the church's rediscovery of these truths might, just might, put Catholicism in a position to help secular modernity save itself from its own increasing incoherence. Now, George, you're there in Rome. You were covering this uh, Amazon Synod. Are you hearing coherence from the church in Rome these days? Seems just the opposite from where I sit. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a problem here in Rome uh, these couple of weeks, uh, Raymond. I think there are a lot of people here uh, who are still trying to make Catholic light work. 
were thinking of the church as a, as a kind of non-governmental organization, not as a communion of disciples and mission. I think we're learning that the church in Latin America, or at least a lot of it, is still stuck in the 1970s. And that's a tragedy mm -hmm. because a path forward has been demonstrated. Uh, it's been demonstrated in all of the living parts of the world's church I just cited, and, and yet we're still kind of spinning our wheels here. That's mm. too bad. Yeah. There's a section of the book that, that frankly, um, I was riveted to. I, I, I finished it last night, and the chapter is called The Franciscan Stall. And you point to two controversies that pose serious obstacles to the new evangelization and the church's capacity to reconstruct <clears throat> the foundations of modern public life. And those two things are basically Amoris Laetitia, and it's granting the sacrament of communion to men and women who have not gotten an annulment and have remarried, and what you call the Gallican uh, 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 concept of the church. Explain to people why those two obstacles are such high bars to the church engaging the modern world today. I, I think, Raymond, beneath the confusions uh, surrounding the implementation of Amoris Laetitia is a deeper question, and that is, does revelation, does God's word, for example, the word of the Lord on the nature of marriage, the word of St. Paul uh, on worthiness to receive Holy Communion, does, does revelation judge history or does history judge revelation? The forces at the synods of 2014 and 2015, which were pressing hard for a church, uh, for a change in the church's sacramental discipline, are those who believe that history judges revelation, that sometimes we mm -hmm. actually know better than the Lord or St. Paul about how to make the gospel work. That's been a very bad set of ideas in the Christian world for about the last 250 years. It has manifestly hollowed out what used to be the large, vibrant churches of liberal Protestantism, and we should not want to imitate that in the Catholic Church. Hmm. The Gallican problem uh, is, that, is the notion that the Catholic Church is not a universal church with distinctive local expressions. Mm -hmm. It's a federation of national churches. This doesn't work either. Look at the Anglican Communion, which is rather badly incoherent today because what goes in Uganda or Nigeria doesn't go in Yorkshire or uh, London. Uh, this is not a formula for saying to an increasingly skeptical but also increasingly desperately needy postmodern world, look, we think we have been given the truth of our humanity in Jesus Christ, and we'd like to offer that to you. Mm. We can't say that if we don't know what that means and mm. what boundaries it sets on, on our human activity. But, but, George, there seems to be a division implied today, and, it's, and look, it's coming out of, of, of Germany, it's coming out of Rome these days, that there's a, uh, a conflict between doctrine and belief and love of Jesus Christ, that they're somehow at odds and uh, uh, that division, it seems to me, is a canard. And in fact, it drives people further away from that love of Jesus Christ, if that indeed is the goal. Yeah, that's really a bad idea, Raymond. The no notion that truth and mercy mm -hmm. are somehow in, in a profound tension, mm -hmm. even in opposition, is just wrong. The most merciful pe thing we can do for anyone is to help him or her understand the truth of their situation, what makes for real happiness, beatitude, human flourishing, and then accompany them. I'm all for accompaniment. Mm -hmm. uh, accompany them as they grow into that truth. But the notion that you can set truth and mercy against each other yeah. is, is really pernicious, yeah. and uh, it needs to be uh, countered with the Lord's own words, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free, and it will set you free in the deepest meaning of human liberation. And none of us live that truth perfectly. We all need to admit that. But in admitting that, we shouldn't try to dumb down the truth. Mm.
George, I want to get to uh, Commonweal uh, took some shots at your book uh, in a long uh, review slash critique. I want to read a little bit of this review and just get your reaction. They say, in general, Weigel believes that our present moment, which he calls post-modernity, is defined by the curse of rampant individualism, which is both intellectual and moral components. Intellectually, he believes we have, in our universities especially, abandoned a commitment to rationality and truth. And they go on and say, Weigel's not interested in the many ways that secular and religious people today craft morally meaningful lives for themselves. He's not interested in the role of the, that the universities can play in that process. A minor yet persistent theme in the book is the claim that universities are purveyors of relativism and no longer teach people to apprehend the truth. They also suggest you write this in bad faith. Your reaction? Well, that was a hit piece. It was published four weeks before the book was available. <laughs> so it was manifestly a, a review, quote unquote, intended to kill the baby in the cradle. Mm. Uh, this is really bad behavior, it seems to me. It is dishonest. It's certainly unfair. Mm. And it's a gross misrepresentation of the book. Now, I think my description of what's going on on most elite university campuses today, including yeah. the campus where the uh, gentleman in question, the reviewer, yeah. teaches, is entirely accurate. Mm. No one is going to make, no serious person, is going to make the argument that elite universities today are bastions of free speech. On the contrary, they're bastions of political correctness. Mm -hmm. And if it's not understood by our friends at Commonweal, how this rampant and rancid individualism is eroding our political culture, is making for many, many unhappy lives, an increasingly disturbing suicide rate, especially mm -hmm. among young people, then it's not me that's out of touch. It's the editors at Commonweal. Mm. You write in here, and I'll leave you with this, uh, you, you, you take on the sex abuse crisis as well and the stumbling block that presents to the church as it seeks to engage the modern world. In what way can the church get past this really loss of moral voice and moral authority in the, in the wake of the sex abuse crisis so it can provide the answers that you claim it has for every human life? Raymond, the first thing I think all of us within the church need to do is live this as a moment of necessary purification. The purification is going to be painful, but it's absolutely essential because unless we are seen to live what we propose, mm. what we propose makes for, for genuine human flourishing, happiness, beatitude, fulfilled lives, unless we're seen to live that, Nobody's going to listen to us. Mm. So we are in an essential moment of purifying ourselves for the work of evangelization mm. and for the work of cultural reformation. Mm. Our culture is crumbling around us. And if we are going to be able to say, no, look, we have, we think, a better idea of what makes the human person happy, what makes for good marriages, stable families, loving relationships, compassion for the poor and the mar marginalized. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to make that proposal unless we're seen to live it in, in the life of the church itself. And that's going to mean some painful purification. Mm. George Weigel, thank you for being here. The book, The Irony of Modern Catholic History, is available everywhere. Bookstores, online, go get a copy. Thank you, George. Thank you, Raymond. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. The Papal Posse will be here and a special guest. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.